Hello everyone and welcome to today's Gen webinar, which is entitled CRISPR off target effects tracked with directional genomic hybridization. Our webinar was made possible today through sponsorship from Chromatid. As usual, I'll be your host for today's event. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, which has been the leading source of information on new tools and technologies within the life science industry for over 40 years. Well, off-targeting is often the thing that shall not be named among genome editing scientists. An inevitable result from even the best gene editing techniques. And although individual errors are rare, their accrual within population can encompass a significant portion of the edited cells. As such, investigators are always seeking new ways of optimizing edited systems to minimize rates of structural variation. Now, traditionally, methods of measuring these off-target effects and errors have often relied on pooled DNA combined with next-gen sequencing and PCR. Unfortunately, these techniques are not really suitable for quantitating the low prevalence, random, variable, and complex structural variation characteristics. And today our presenters are going to tell us a little bit more about a technique that just might be the solution to precise measurements of off-targeting. So before we get the webinar underway, let's meet our presenters for today's event and learn a little bit more about them. Dr. Christopher Tompkins, is the Chief Technology Officer at Chromatid, where he leads the team's launching of Chromatid's genomic structural products and services for gene editing and gene therapy. Chris has over 25 years of experience in the life science industry and has been involved in launching numerous pharmaceutical, diagnostic, and biotechnology products. Now, Chris will be co-presenting today with his colleague, Aaron Cross, who is the Vice President of R&D at Chromatid, where she has helped pioneer Chromatid's flagship technology, directional genomic hybridization, something you're gonna hear a lot more about in just a few moments. And Aaron has extensive experience in molecular biology, virology, and genetics, and she's aided Chromatid's push of its cytogenetic and cellular engineering research. And today, Chris and Aaron are gonna tell us much more about a novel cytogenetic method for visualizing structural chromosomal rearrangements, inversions, and translocations using directional genomic hybridization. But before we get the webinar underway, I wanna remind the audience that we'd love to hear from you in our Q&A session. It's much more fun if you guys send in questions and makes things a lot more lively and interesting. So if you have a question for Chris and Aaron about their presentation, don't hesitate. You don't have to wait until the end of the webinar. Send it in anytime. All you need to do is type your question in the ask a question box and then hit submit. All right, with that said, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Chris and Aaron. I'm Christopher Tompkins, CTO of Chromatid, and with me today is Aaron Cross, our VP of R&D. We'd both very much like to thank you all for attending today and also the organizers for hosting this webinar. What we're going to discuss today is Chromatid's platform for genomic structural analysis, directional genomic hybridization, or DGH. And we've also prepared a number of case studies, which we hope you will find useful. Now, directional genomic hybridization falls into a class of metaphase probing or painting methods that may be used to map chromosomal structure and structural variation. Shown here in cartoon space are Chromatid's DGH tools. DGH Screen and DGH Discover are whole genome mapping methods employing millions of fluorescently labeled hybridization probes to map chromosomes or even entire genomes. DGH Insight uses the same DGH method but to map localized structures of interest. For instance, rearrangements involving edit sites or the locations of random lentiviral inserts throughout the genome. DGH Screen and DGH Insight are available to researchers worldwide today, and our first assays based on DGH Discover are currently in beta testing. With these three products, you can map literally any structure or structural change to genes, chromosomes, or genomes using single cells in metaphase. 
For situations where this data is important, but cells are already fixed or won't divide, say hepatocytes, we employ pinpoint fish, a technique that uses DGH insight probes in a very old school cytogenetic method. There are, of course, other old-school techniques that can provide data on chromosomal structures, but typically at a much lower resolution than DGH. G-banding, for instance, is a technique for staining the secondary structure of chromosomes and is a fantastic method for orthogonally confirming large structural changes, such as trisomies. But where we are today resolving structural variants of 5 kilobases or less with DGH, techniques like G-banding have resolutions of only 10 to 15 megabases. If we move from cartoon space to look at some actual data, here we have two single cells from different experiments. On the left is a metaphase spread from a cell with a double edit to one chromosome, and on the right is a complete metaphase spread painted with DGH screen. For comparison, DGH Insight uses a few thousands of DNA hybridization probes in three colors to detect edit site structural variation. The DGH screen assay uses over 10 million probes in five colors to map all the unique sequence in the genome and can provide a complete picture of off-target and edit site structural variation. Zooming in on one of the chromosomes on the right, this assay is designed to detect structural variation at the edit site. The blue background is a stain that highlights the chromosomal structure, and we have placed green and red probes atop two CRISPR edits 10 kb apart, and we then put a yellow probe into that gap. Even though localized, DGH Insight is unbiased and will detect normal edit site structures and literally any other structural variation involving these edits, including translocations to any other chromosome. The split in the yellow signal indicates the relatively common inversion that occurs between the edit sites. If we now move to the DGH screen data, you can see a small telomeric inversion on one homolog of chromosome 1 and an unbalanced translocation involving C19 and C17. This translocation is interesting as it's a major rearrangement involving a complete fusion of one chromosome to another. Ultra high resolution data on single cells like this is useful and can be essential data for identifying variants and also editing byproducts. And if you're working with clones, you may only need data on a few cells to fully characterize all the structural variants in your cells. But the products of cellular engineering processes will by nature be batches of heterogeneous structural variants. In cases where CRISPR-based editing, for instance, leads to off-target translocations, or lentiviral transgenes are scattered across the genome, DNA is damaged by toxins, or cell lines, for instance, may have turns unstable, it's important to map many cells with DGH and profile the distribution of structures in the manner shown here for hypothetical dual CRISPR edit in, say, T cells. Variants that are shown in red, the inversion between the edits, edit site translocations, and a high degree of aneuploidy are variants associated with the edited cells and differ from the wild type. The low prevalence of random variants, shown in black below the baseline, are primarily SCEs and are associated with normal DNA repair activity. Unless these rates become elevated, they are typically not a concern. The variant on CX is a constitutional variant and is shown in green because it was, in this hypothetical experiment, contributed by the donor cells and was not associated in any way with the editing. Genomes are by nature heterogeneous and it's a very common occurrence for DGH to detect pre-existing structural variants. And if this were, say, a therapy, it can be very helpful to distinguish pre-existing and edited associated structural variants in this manner. Those of you that are familiar with metaphase techniques will have seen that DGH is not metaphase fish, and in fact the exceptional single cell resolution of structure and structural variation is only possible because DGH is a next generation cytogenetics method performed on a unique analyte, specially prepared metaphase chromosomes. A standard metaphase chromosome has four strands of DNA, two parental strands and two daughter strands. In DGH, however, we degrade the daughter strands from the metaphase, leaving only the two parental strands, one on each sister chromatid in the metaphase. These strands are naturally oppositely oriented, one 5' prime to 3' prime and one 3' prime to 5'. Prime. We then probe these oriented strands not with double-stranded back probes, but with single-stranded synthetic DNA probes, which are designed to hybridize only to one side of the DGH metaphase chromosome, as shown here in pink. Essentially, this adds an orientation dimension to our image data. If the target is oriented normally, it will hybridize to the expected sister chromatid. If the target is inverted, however, the corresponding probes will jump to the other sister chromatid, as indicated in the cartoon. 
With this added orientation dimension, DGH can detect all the structural outcomes of editing in single cells, all the inversions and translocations, regardless of if they are on target or off target. We began working in the gene editing and gene therapy space in 2017 and have applied DGH up and down the typical workflow. Before I turn it over to Aaron, I wanted to take just a moment to highlight the types of gene editing studies that have employed our DGH platform. Today, DGH is being used extensively to map random lentiviral and AAV integrations, to select clones, to QC cell lines, and to assess stability or instability of cell lines. DGH data has informed a number of IND projects, and we have just recently filed a piece of IP covering applications of DGH to assess relative genotox risks. Aaron is going to kick off a deeper dive into some data with a case study illustrating the power of DGH to measure the heterogeneous structural variations associated with CRISPR edited cells. After that, we'll look at measuring integrational copy number, and then today with a case study showing both instability and the beginnings of clonal outgrowth of a subpopulation of cells. Hello, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, Chris. Let me start by walking you through this system. As Chris just described, DGH can be used to quantitate structural variation across many cells in edited cell populations. DGH assessment of cell lines or patient samples before and after gene editing can identify the genomic structural effects of the editing process, both at the intended edit site and across the rest of the genome on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. For this case study, we are quantifying off-target effects of a CRISPR-Cas9 dual edit in a model cell line. HEC293FT cells were edited at two different sites in the P53 gene. DGH Insight was then used to measure structural variation in the P53 region. The red and green probes target the two edit sites. Four copies of the chromosome 17 target are present in these cells, and one copy is constitutionally deleted, analogous to the example Chris mentioned. In total, with three copies of the P53 gene, two edits at each site, there are six possible edit sites and therefore six concurrent double-strand breaks generated during the edit. These double-strand breaks will be present along with any other double-strand breaks occurring naturally in the cell, creating many opportunities for misrepair. Let's take a look at an edited cell with structural variants. Here is a cell with one normal homologue of chromosome 17, one with a split signal indicating an inversion involving the p53 gene and the constitutional deletion of the p53 gene. On the left are enlargements of each rearrangement and the signal pattern associated with each event. Additionally, translocations involving the P53 and other off-target chromosomes, unbalanced translocations between two separate homologues of chromosome 17, additional deletions of the P53 gene, as well as various combinations of these events in single cells were observed in the edited cells. In summary, structural rearrangement rates to the P53 region including translocations, inversions, and deletions, were measured in edited cells at an elevated rate above both the control and the reagent-only control. This small study works well to illustrate the capabilities of DGH to measure editing-related genomic structural outcomes above both the background of events occurring naturally in the untreated controls, as well as any background from the delivery method. Moving from CRISPR edits to transgene integrations, this is a single cell from a multiplex assay designed to map out both on-target and off-target integrations, cell by cell and chromosome by chromosome. The green probes in the enlargement are not transgenes, but instead are marker or babysitter probes at the intended integration site. This babysitter probe strategy can be used in reverse to mark sites where integrations might be problematic, say potential genotoxic sites or sites of integrational mutagenesis. The pink paints are our DGH screen assay used here on only three chromosomes, one, two, and three. We include these in many assay designs where it's important to measure rates of off-target DNA damage or to monitor the stability of the edited cell population at the same time as we track the integration events. Now, in fact, this cell is pretty uninteresting as there's no integrations and no DNA damage whatsoever to highlight. The transgene in this experiment is 10 KB in size, and the transgene tracking probes in this assay are yellow. If you look at the enlargements on the left, you can see that this cell had both an SCE detected by our screen paints on the top and a single on-target integration below. 
The transgene probe, however, doesn't sit directly on the babysitter probe. The yellow and green signals are clearly split and clearly on opposite sister chromatids of this metaphase, indicating that the lone insertion event in this cell resulted in an inverted, not normal transgene. This assay will detect and can be used to locate not just the on-target integrations, but off-targets too, regardless of where they are inserted into the genome. On the right is the entire metaphase spread from a single cell. All the scattered yellow signals throughout the genome and across all the chromosomes are transgenes detected by DGH. In the enlarged region on the left, you can clearly see three distinct signal patterns. One, on-target integration indicated by the fuse yellow and green signals, inserted normally this time, one bare target site without an integration event at all, and one off-target integration, a yellow signal without a corresponding green babysitter probe. If we look across the many cells in this experiment, we can then summarize the results on a per cell basis as is shown here. The overall integrational copy number per cell, taking into account both on-targets and off-target integrations, was just under eight. And it is clear that even though we are tracking target sites, the characteristics of this transgene insertion were clearly random in nature. And we also didn't observe any other recurrent integration locations that would have indicated that the insertions were directed to other loci in the genome beyond or besides the target site. With DGH, we can go beyond profiling the number and locations of the integrations on a per cell basis. What we're showing here is a control probe we have inserted into the system on chromosome 8. The control probe is the same size as the transgene and gives an identical signal to a single transgene integration. By taking the ratio of the signal size of the transgene to that of the control probe, we can actually estimate the integrational copy number of each integration event, not just the copy number per cell. Before we switch gears and Aaron dives deep into whole genome DGH screen data, I thought I would spend a few moments talking about those pink DGH screen paints we insert into the InSight assays. Now, we have a long history of working with NASA and the NIH using chromosomes as biodosimeters by measuring the structural variations caused by ionizing radiation and other toxins. By adding those same screen paints to our other assay designs, we can not only observe any rates of off-target DNA damage, we can then put those measurements in context. Are they normal or are they elevated in some way that suggests that the cell's DNA repair pathways are not functioning as expected, for instance? This data shown here is from the twin study performed by Susan Bailey, one of our founders, using DGH screen in conjunction with NASA. One astronaut twin, now a U.S. congressman, stayed on Earth, and one twin spent a year at the space station. On the left is a metaphase spread from actual astronaut blood, and on the right is the summary data showing an increased burden of structural variants that a year in a space can generate. Since chromosomes are excellent biodosimeters, we can actually calibrate the radiation dose to structural variants. This is data from another study chromatid in the Bailey lab performed for the NIH, where we measured the received radiation dose in veterans exposed to fallout at U.S. nuclear test sites. This calibration data shown here is not from the actual veterans, but from young, healthy, non-smoking controls. We drew and then irradiated their blood, not the actual control subjects, and measured the inversions and translocations at different doses to give a very classic dose-response relationship. Translocations are on the bottom in this chart, and inversions are on the top, and you can clearly see that inversions are a much more sensitive measure of dose than translocations, probably because they are typically smaller and do less fatal damage to the affected cells. There's another very interesting insight we can pull from this data. If we zoom in on the axis at the zero dose point, you can clearly see that there is some baseline burden of structural variation, even in young, healthy non-smokers. In this case, about one structural variant in every two to three cells. We see this baseline burden of structural variation time and time again, in one's clonal cell lines, for instance, or in T-cell donors. Humans are heterogeneous, cells get damaged, and DNA misrepairs. If you are developing a new therapy, knowing the actual baseline burden in your cell population can help you understand that a specific variation, or even an elevated level of random variation, isn't associated with your edits, but instead is simply a carryover from the cells you're editing.
artists just walk through an example using a mini screen assay comprised of DGH paints for the three largest human chromosomes for the purpose of biodosimetry. Moving to our whole genome screen assay, this is what a painted metaphase spread actually looks like. DNA organized into metaphase chromosomes allows us to visualize genomic structural rearrangements as pattern changes versus in an interphase nucleus where the paints have no contextual reference. These images are taken at 100x magnification and organized in silico into a karyogram of the genome for analysis. The karyograms provide a map of each cell's genome. In this cell, many structural rearrangements are present. Paints with unbroken signals on a single sister of the metaphase chromosome match the reference genome and do not have any large genomic structural variants. Paints with signal switches to the secondary sister chromatid or insertions of another color indicate the presence of a structural rearrangement. This genome is from a cell with quite a few unsequenceable events. Several sister chromatid exchanges and inversions are present in the circled chromosomes. A complex translocation coupled with a large long arm inversion is present in one homolog of chromosome five and two chromatid type breaks are present labeled triangles. Chromatid is currently collaborating with the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston to provide structural variant data for clonal derivatives of individual human cells surviving ionizing radiation exposure. For the second use case, I'd like to show you the DGH screen results from one of the clones. The DGH screen karyograms here are from two separate cells in a clone derived from a sample irradiated with an iron source. In this clone, there's a recurrent non-reciprocal translocation between chromosome six and chromosome three, visualized as a combination of yellow and orange paint on the second chromosome three homolog in each image. The inversions in the other chromosome three homolog and one homolog of chromosome 12 are new findings for this clone. The rest of the rearrangements, as you can see, vary between both of the cells and represent the background rate of misrepair happening in the cell line. In order to separate the recurrent or clonal events present in a sample from this background rate, several individual genomes must be screened and analyzed. DGH screen provides three categories of data. First, the donor specific or cell line specific events, including subpopulation or mosaic event distributions. Second, the baseline level of random events present in the population. And third, the events above background specific to a treatment or exposure. In this next case study, we will dive into how DGH screen can be used as a genomic stability litmus, in this case, for an immortalized cell line undergoing transformation in culture. This line was provided to us by NIST at a relatively early passage and was generated from the progenitor cell line of the genome in the bottle sequencing standard. These cells were donated by a rare and undiagnosed disease patient and were immortalized via Epstein Barr virus transformation. To start out, we ran a G-banding assay on the cell line and noticed some centromere abnormalities on chromosome 16 and 1, as well as a few band expansions indicating duplication or insertion in a few sporadic chromosomes. No inversions were detected and a few sporadic translocations were observed. The DGH screen data shows a much richer picture of events. Between passages 12 and 18, several prominent karyotype observations were made. Size differences observed between homologs of the same chromosome were present as shown circled in the cell, indicating duplication or other interchromosomal copy number variation happening in several chromosomes. The graph on the right shows the distribution of these events across the genome, with this type of CNV abnormality seen in over 30% of cells for chromosomes 1, 2, and 6. Looking at cells from passage 12 specifically, some aneuploidy was observed with monosomy in 18% of the cells and trisomy in 4% of the cells. There was a low level of chromothripsis and a few complex events in a couple of the cells. By passage 18, centromere abnormalities were being frequently observed in chromosomes 1, 9, and 16. Whole arm deletions and radial gain, as shown circled on chromosome 16 in this cell, as well as prominent centromere spindling occurred in some of the cells. A large portion of the cells were aneuploid, with monosomy observed in 41% of the cells and trisomy in 5% of the cells. Chromosome 16 in particular had a wide array of structural rearrangements observed in a significant portion of the cells. Two inversions, one on the P-arm, one on the Q, were observed regularly. 
several different translocations involving chromosome 16 were present, and more complex rearrangements like whole arm deletions and gain, along with very prominent centromere abnormalities were present in the cell line. One of the strengths of this assay is the event rate and distribution data that comes from the single cell analysis. This instability and variety of structural rearrangement on chromosome 16 developing between passages 12 and 18 alongside other structural changes are observations made possible by a DGH screen approach. Other recurrent inversions were observed across several other chromosomes, shown here in the later passage, passage 18. The rates and distribution of these events, however, changed quite a bit over this critical passaging period for this cell line. Looking at the changes from passage 12 to passage 18 more explicitly, you can see that the rate of chromosome loss, monosomy in the table on the left, has gone up dramatically, along with the rate of complex events. Aneuploidy and complex rearrangements are both hallmarks of chromosome instability. Additionally, the number and prevalence of inversions changed dramatically between the two passages. Of the 34 recurrent inversions observed in passage 12, only seven of those were still detected by passage 18, mostly at increased prevalence, indicating subclonal expansion among the surviving cells. Five passages is not a long period to see such dramatic changes. This highlights the importance of cell line stability assessment and genome QC for both research and therapy pipelines. Building off whole genome screen is Chromatid's newest technology, whole genome eBand, providing location and characterization data to events discovered using DGH screen or other assays. Same analysis approach except band order and position provide location data for observed structural rearrangements. To illustrate one of the other exciting applications of DGH eBand, I'd like to highlight a case study with some early data generated on a rare disease patient as part of a collaboration with the Undiagnosed Disease Consortium. In late 2016 to early 2017, as part of the UNDX-led effort to find a diagnosis for a cohort of patients with unknown likely genetic diseases, Chromatid provided screening for genomic structural abnormalities in these patients. For the initial screening, DGH paints for chromosomes 1, 2, 3, 7, and X were used to analyze patient cells. In blood lymphocytes from one of these individuals, rearrangements were observed on chromosome 2, presenting as a set of variable inversions near the centromere in about 30% of the cells. The same set of rearrangements in chromosome 2 were observed in one of her family members in about 10% of their cells. One of the breakpoints of the observed inversions in chromosome 2 lined up pretty tightly with the location of the DCTN1 gene. A set of follow-up assays were designed to narrow down the breakpoints in the mosaic rearrangements observed on chromosome 2 and assess relative frequency. A location ladder designed to the opposite sister chromatid was used to narrow the breakpoint locations for rearrangements seen on chromosome 2 in conjunction with the paint. One inversion, a pericentric inversion, appears to have breakpoints in the bands on either side of the centromere. The other inversion is a pericentric inversion, sharing the same breakpoints as the pericentric inversion. An additional custom follow-up assay was designed to look at DCTN1 specifically. In the patient, a copy number variation was observed in this gene in 11 of the 25 cells that were scored. One to four additional signals for the gene were seen, with most of the additional copies located either on chromosome 3P near the centromere or on chromosomes 19 through 22. No other family members were found to be positive for copy number variations in DCTN1 in the 25 cells assessed. Since that time, with the advent of DGH eBand, in one assay, additional insight on the rearrangements detected for this patient observed with the custom follow-up assays, as well as screening for additional structural genomic abnormalities across the rest of the genome would be possible. Thanks, Aaron. Now we know there's been a lot of deep data here today. We'd like to conclude by putting the DGH platform's tools into a bit of context by just proposing a workflow showing how all the DGH tools can work together. Beginning at the earliest stages of research, when there's no knowledge about rates or types of variation, 
EGH screen can be used to compare various editing systems, help optimize editing approaches, and sort recurrent structural variation from genomic noise. Our new DGH Discover tools can then be used to identify the breakpoints of that recurrent variation and develop targeted assays for tracking those variants. Using the same DGH probes, we can run either DGH Insight assays on metaphases, as you've seen here today, or targeted pinpoint fish assays in your tissue samples or non-dividing cells, such as hepatocytes. Any of these assays can be qualified, validated, and used for batch QC, can be used in GLP tox studies, IND filings, and even used in clinical studies. All of the data you've seen here today was taken in our own labs as part of our research service business. But nothing you've seen here is hard. These are robust, reliable, and repeatable techniques. And if you'd like to run any of this in your own lab, we'd love to put it in a box and ship it to you. We'll even ship you Aaron to train your team. And with that, just once again, thank you very much for being here today. Chris, Aaron, really great presentation. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Really interesting technology, I think, based on the number of questions that have come in. Let's get our Q&A underway so we can try to get through as many of your questions as possible. All right, everyone, thanks for joining the Q&A session. We have a bunch of questions here for Chris and Aaron, so let's get to it and try to get through as many of your questions as possible. Uh, Chris, first question is for you. Um, it looks like Marianne has a question, uh, wants to know, can uh, DGH be used to detect repair of SNPs? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, unfortunately, no, the resolution of DGH is in the kilobase, uh, not in the base pair at this point. And so we can see small structural variations on the size of two to four kilobases and above, So, uh, but not anything in the, in the size of a SNP. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Aaron, next uh, question for you, two-part question, pretty straightforward though. Uh, an audience member would like to know, can I run uh, DGH in my lab? And if so, what do I need to run DGH? Great, thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the DGH method can absolutely be transferred to run in any standard lab, equipped to perform cell culture, do right routine cytogenetic analysis. Um, we offer kits for the cell culture prep piece of the protocol. And we regularly run DGH as a service on samples prepared both by customers as well as prepared in-house for our, our customers um, as a service. For many of our standard assays, methods can be easily transferred to running customer labs. Um, and once custom assays have been produced and validated, those can be transferred as well. There's a few specialized reagents that are available commercially, and UV stratolinker is required or equivalent as well as a microscope equipped to visualize the fluorophores that are included in the assay, as well as visualize at 100x the metaphases. But yes, we can. All righty, thank you for that. Uh, Chris, we have a question for you, two-parter as well. Uh, an audience member would like to know, uh, why can't we just sequence the structural variants, and uh, why can DGH detect structural variants that the sequence misses? Sure. And so it's a kind of a complicated answer to this question, but when you edit batches of cells or you do integration, you get a lot of random locations. Those random locations can be in repetitive sequences. And so it becomes very, very difficult if you think in terms of a heterogeneous mixture of structural variants where you could have repetitive breakpoints, uh, you can have random breakpoints and you can have defined breakpoints to actually get uh, a real good sequence of all of the structural variations in that batch. So what you tend to see then is when you sequence these things, and we've done quite a bit of comparative studies, is you get a lot of false positives and false negatives for the true structural variation in your batch. Compared to DGH, where we simply just map out all the structures in the genome, um, we can provide the, essentially the ground truth for what's really in the edited cells, cell by cell. All righty, thank you, Chris. Uh, Aaron, back to you. Brendan has a question, and you'd like to know, what is the sensitivity of the assay? Sure, that's also a really good question. Um, and I think Chris alluded to it a little bit earlier with his question, uh, with his answer about the SNPs. We can regularly detect structural variants. That would be inversions, insertions, even translocations that are as, in, as small as 2 kb. And anything larger than that, we're also able to see. So that's, that's basically the sensitivity of our assay. And then, um, you know, on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, we're able to 
uh, put together that picture so that it's not necessarily the, the equivalent of what you'd get with pooled, a pooled DNA approach. So there's sensitivity in the fact that you get the distribution of those events, those small events on a cell-by-cell -cell basis as well. And I'll just add to that answer as far as the sensitivity, if you're thinking about prevalence, is how low of a prevalence can you detect? So can we detect rare structural variants? Um, the answer to that is yes, we just simply count more cells. So if you do 200 cells, you get about a 1% prevalence of a structural variant. If you want uh, to go lower than that, do 300, 500, or more cells. All righty. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris, we have a question for you from Vineet, who would like to know, can DGH uh, be used to detect off-target effects from in vitro hepatocytes and hepatocytes and cuffer cells co-culture? Sure. And it's, it's really a pretty simple answer for that. If uh, you can get your cells to divide and form metaphases, we can use DGH. In the case of most hepatocytes that are you know, kind of in stasis, not dividing, we would um, default to pinpoint fish, which is kind of a spinoff of the DGH platform. Pinpoint fish cannot do whole genome in hepatocytes, but we can certainly measure any targeted structural variant. So it's very akin to uh, DGH insight in that case. All righty. Thank you for that. Let's get to some more questions. Kathy has a question for you guys, and she'd like to know, can you apply this hybridization technique to cells and tissues rather than cell culture for interphase nuclei? So, yes, we can apply this hybridization technique to cells and tissues, and it's got the same caveat that Chris mentioned where, um, you know, we're going to be looking at pinpoint fish signals in the nucleus rather than metaphases with the whole genome assay, so targeted assays only. But yes, we have FSPE-based protocols. We've also worked with dissociated cells, cytospin, and we're happy to basically accommodate the cell culture needs of any specific project. We consult with people all of the time to generate custom solutions for those. All righty, thank you for that. Another question. Also from Kathy, who would like to know, do you have any kits for mouse tissues or cells versus human cells? Yeah, so uh, we certainly do. And uh, DGH and Pinpoint Fish both work in any sequenced mammalian genome. So uh, mouse is probably our second most common genome. Um, we also have canine, macaque, uh, wild boar, and a few others. But we can work with anything. So if we can download the genome, we can design the probes for it. All righty. One question we have is, can Chromatid provide GLP services? Yes, we certainly can. We can provide GLP. All of our assays in this space, except for DJ Screen, tend to be custom assays. So we would work with whoever the customer or client is for that assay to get it validated and provide the GLP. And then that is something that we can certainly transfer to any other site, including your own manufacturer. That's where you would like it run. So we do have a couple more questions here. Melanie would like to know, do I need an additional tool to identify heterozygous line after genome editing? I can take that. It, it kind of depends on the nature of the heterozygosity of your cell line. If it's a heterozygote in, in the fact that you have one copy of a structural variant that we're able to de detect with DGH, then no. I think that if there's heterozygosity that can only be detected um, with sequencing, then we can run DGH alongside to detect other structural variants associated with the editing, potentially off-target effects, et cetera. But we would not be able to see the heterozygosity associated with a single base pair change. All righty. Thank you for that. Next question we have, they'd like to know what DGH stands for. I'll let you guys tackle that one. Yeah, that's a directional genomic hybridization, and so it uh, really emphasizes the strand-specific nature of the thing and the ability to uh, measure orientation. All right. Another question we have here is, do you have these cells for available for a 3D microfluidic device? If you, if you get your cells from a 3D microfluidic device, which is kind of what I'm seeing the question being asked, it doesn't really matter where you get your cells from or how you're processing them, how you're isolating them. As long as you have intact nuclei, then absolutely we can run pinpoint fish or insight. And if those are living cells and they are dividing still, then we can get metaphases from those cells if you're able to get them back in culture. 
So for either question, I believe yes. And if you want a more specific consultation, please reach out. All right. And it looks like we have time for one last question. What is the turnaround time for running DGH? Sure. I'll take that one. And I, I see there's one also about cost, so I can address that too. And so the cost of the assay is a few thousand dollars per analysis. It is typically done uh, for insight with uh, custom probes. And so there's, we can generate custom probes for this assay in the matter of a couple weeks. And those two also cost a few thousand dollars for the custom probes. The turnaround time for the assay really depends on how many samples we get. But if you're sending us a small number of samples, it's about two weeks to turn around the sample. And that includes the cell culture time. All righty. Thank you for that. And now we have come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website at genengnews.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again or feel free to forward the link to any of your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend. I'd like to thank Aaron and Chris for their very informative presentation. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Chromatid for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy.